Good morning. He is risen. I want to invite you to stand. We're so glad you joined us for our Easter service. Um, we're just going to sing with all of our hearts today and, and then worship the God who gave his son to save us. I the Savior's son. seat. If you're a new 
visitor to us today. We thank you for coming. Um, we have a connection card that's on the seats around you. It's a piece of paper, about yay big. And uh, we're going to ask you to fill that out. And if you do that, you go to the help desk, you will be given a free gift. No strings attached. We're not going to harass you or bother you, I promise. Uh, and if you're a regular attender, we'd still love for you to fill out the connection card, too. You can do that with, on that piece of paper or digitally by texting PN Connect to 97000. Or you can go to Church Center app, bottom tab, says connection card. And also there's places on there to volunteer or have prayer. We have the staff prays for you, so you can do that. Also, uh, we have um, sermon notes. If you wanted to follow along with the message, you can do that. There's paper versions as you walked in. Or you can download an app called My Sermon Notes. You can take a picture of that little caption code up there, or behind me, or to my right. And uh, it'll take you to the Google Play or the App Store, depending on what phone you have. And you can download it and follow along with Pastor Tom as he brings us the good news today. Um, we have a VBS coming up in July, so if you're interested in um, knowing more about that, maybe being a volunteer. We have a meeting next Sunday, right after church. Um, so I ask you to join us for that. And lastly, for the women, there's a, a spring mingle called the Springle. It's going to happen Saturday, April 20th, 1 to 3. And uh, it sounds a lot like a lot of fun. And the theme is spring cleaning, like cleaning out your heart for Jesus. It's, it's a good stuff. There's going to be games and food, and you just have to bring a, an appetizer. It's going to be a great time right here at church, April 20th, 1 to 3. Register on the church center. All right, we have some good worship music in store for you, so I want to invite you to stand with us, and, uh, and we're just going to sing our heart out, right? Right?
Say 
It's just as that song says, but all we have is a hallelujah. We come here today to worship you, to praise you, to glorify you, knowing that what you did is just so beyond our feeble little minds, what we can imagine, the love that you have for us. But today, so we just want to give it all to you. I just pray that today, if there's some people in here who don't know you, today's the day they do come to know you. They feel your presence. Resurrection. It's a word that we say sometimes so casually, so nonchalantly. You know, we say it in passing at times when the reality is without the resurrection, not only would there not be any church, there would be no Christianity. I mean, without the resurrection, everything that took place in the life and ministry to Jesus, it adds up to nothing. Without the resurrection, the virgin birth is meaningless. Without the resurrection, the Christ's perfect obedience to the Father, meaningless. Without the resurrection, his miracles are meaningless. You know, everything hinges on the events that take place in Luke 24 and its parallel passage in John chapter 20. I mean, even Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. If Christ has not been raised, not only is your faith useless, but you're still guilty. That is, you're still dead in your sins. Now, fortunately for us, he continues that thought a little later on, and he says, but praise be the Lord, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. In fact, today as we take a closer look at the resurrection and the events that surround that resurrection, we're going to be looking at these events and how they impact our lives. You know, when we look in the Gospels, we find some interesting things that take place on the day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We know in the very early morning hours, women went out to his tomb, and not seeing any Roman guards there, and seeing that the stone had been removed, they went into the tomb only to find it empty. I mean, the women were were, were panicking. They were getting, you know, anxious. You know, this disturbed them when suddenly angels appeared to them and said, why do you look for the living among the dead? Don't you know he has risen so the women, they go back, they try to find the 11 disciples. The, they, they tell the disciples everything that they saw, everything that they witnessed in the empty tomb. The disciples, believe it or not, they thought it was nonsense. They thought these women were crazy. you, you got to be, no way, you were hallucinating, you were dreaming. So Peter and John, they go to the tomb only to find that it was exactly as the women had said. They get to the tomb, John kind of stays back, Peter marches right in, and he finds that, yeah, there's nothing here but but grave clothes. 
They go back home, but Mary Magdalene, she hangs around. And it's that point that she discovers the risen Jesus. At first, she thinks it's a gardener until he begins to speak, and suddenly her, her eyes are opened up, and she sees that it's the, the resurrected Jesus. In fact, on that day, Jesus appeared to a number of people. There were two of his followers going on the road to Emmaus, and they were discussing the events of the day and the crucifixion, and suddenly Jesus appears before them. Now, they don't recognize Jesus at first. It's not until Jesus comes home with them and they're breaking bread together that suddenly their eyes are opened and they see it's Jesus Christ. They, in turn, go to find the disciples, and they are all gathered all in a room, and suddenly Jesus appears before them. It's Jesus Christ, three days earlier in the grave, and now he has risen. In fact, why his appearance is significant and what it means to us is at the heart of Easter. In fact, we'll find in Luke 24 that God makes three definitive statements about the resurrection. And these statements that are found here in this passage, they give us plenty of reason why we need to take Easter seriously today. Listen, today, if you have doubts about the resurrection, you're not sure if you believe in it. Or for that matter, you might believe in it, but you think, well, what, is, what does that have to do with me? I think Luke 24 has some good news for you. I'm going to ask if you would to go ahead and turn to that passage. We are in Luke chapter 24, and if you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand, and our ushers will be more than happy to give you a copy of God's Word, and that is yours to keep. But we are in Luke chapter 24, and we're going to begin with verse 33. This is after Jesus has revealed himself to the two on the road to Emmaus, and we're going to find what takes place after that. But we're in Luke 24, beginning with verse 33. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true, the Lord is risen and he's appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread with them. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do, you, why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands, look at my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me, see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of the joy and amazement that they had, he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened up their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power on high. So friends, what exactly does this passage tell us about the resurrection? Well, first and foremost, it tells us this. The resurrection is a life-altering historical event. Now, if you look back in our passage, it's kind of interesting that the very first thing that Jesus tells the disciples when he first appears to them it says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Now, keep in mind, according to John 20, 26, the disciples are in a locked room together. They're afraid now, now that Jesus is dead, they're afraid the Jewish officials are going to come looking for them. They, they're afraid of retaliation. So they're all locked together in a, in a room. Doors are bolted shut. No way to get in or out. Jesus appears to them. How would you react if suddenly Jesus appears to you in a locked room? I mean, these guys, I'm sure, are frightened. So, so Jesus says, peace be with you. But keep in mind, there's probably another reason why he uses that phrase. Just three days earlier, folks, three days earlier, these disciples had abandoned Jesus. When trouble came looking, they headed for the hills. I mean, all of those promises about we're going to be with you to the end. We'll die with you. We'll always be by your side. We're gone. They vanished. 
When, when trouble came around, these, these men, the, these followers of Jesus, these disciples, they headed for the hills. They were not there when Jesus was dying on the cross. You can imagine seeing Jesus for the first time since his death was awkward at best. They were embarrassed. They were humiliated. They know how they had been. They knew how they had abandoned Jesus. Jesus knows this. So what does he say? Peace be with you. No criticism here, no rebuke. Guys, you can relax. That's in your past. Let's move forward now. In fact, he asks a question in verse 38. He says, "Why are you troubled and why do you why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands, look at my feet." I mean, it's I myself. Touch me and see. A a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. Why is it important that Jesus says, touch my body, touch my hands, touch my feet? Why is it important in just a few minutes he says, hey, you have something to eat? Let's eat together. Because he wants them to know it's really me. This isn't a hallucination. This isn't a ghost. This isn't a vision. This isn't a figment of your imagination. I'm actually here with you. But here's the funny thing. This isn't the only occasion that this takes place. You know, if we look in Acts chapter 1, Luke says this on the matter. He says, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, these weren't the only witnesses either. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says this on the matter. Paul says, after the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus appeared to Peter, and then he appeared to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. Then he appeared to James, then he appeared to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also. Both of these scriptures have earmarks of an eyewitness account. I mean, names are given. Paul throws in there, listen, if you don't believe me, these people are still walking around. I mean, these people aren't dead. I mean, if you don't believe my word, there are plenty of witnesses that saw the resurrected Jesus. In fact, he says that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. You may ask yourself, well, how in the world can that happen? I mean, how can Jesus actually appear to 500 people at the same time? Consider this. During Jesus' earthly ministry, he would preach to thousands of people at the same time. Remember the feeding of the 5,000? You know, in those days, you only counted men in attendance. So there was probably about 12,000 people during that occasion. Well, if he can appear for before five to 10,000 people, he can certainly appear before 500 people, probably in a teaching setting. In the words of Lee Strobel in his book, The Case for Christ, Strobel puts it this way. To put it into perspective, if you were to call each one of the witnesses to a court of law to be cross-examined for just 15 minutes, and you went around the clock without a break, it would take you from breakfast on Monday until dinner on Friday to hear all of it. After listening to 129 straight hours of eyewitness testimony, who could possibly walk away unconvinced? But here's the thing, it's not just the number of people that Jesus appeared to. It's the type of people that Jesus appeared to. I think it's very significant that the Gospels make mention that the first person that saw the resurrected Jesus was a woman. It was Mary Magdalene. Why? That doesn't mean a whole lot to us today. It was a big deal in Jesus' day. Because in Jesus' day, as sad as it is to say, women didn't have a whole lot of status. I mean, women's eyewitness testimony could not be admitted into a court of law. I mean, they they were not held in high regard. So, if you're going to make up a story about the resurrected Jesus and you want people to believe you, if you're going to make up a fable, a legend, and you want to convince people that this is true, who would you have seeing the resurrected Jesus? Would it be women? No. It would be men. The fact that it was women at the tomb in the morning and it was Mary Magdalene that saw Jesus first tells us what? It tells us that is exactly what happened. Luke had no alternative but to give the truth. Anything else would be a lie. And then, of course, there's the case of the Apostle Paul. Paul says that he saw the resurrected Jesus, and we know when that happened on the road to Damascus. We don't need to get into that this morning. 
But the fact that Paul saw the resurrected Jesus is very significant. If you know anything about biblical history and you know about Paul's pre-Christian life, it wasn't pretty. Paul, as a, as a staunch, devout Pharisee, uh, really hated Christianity, hated this man by the name of Jesus. And, and Paul thought that he was doing God a service by hunting down Christians and either imprisoning them or putting them to death. That was his life's purpose. Back then, he was known as Saul, and Saul loved hunting down followers of what he called the way. That is, of course, until something happened to his life. Now, all of a sudden, Paul, he's, not only is he no longer hunting down Christians, he's one of them. Not only is he not trying to kill Christians, he's willing to die for his faith. What happened to Paul? Well, the resurrection happened. And when you see a man in front of you that supposedly died, and he's telling you, Paul, you need to follow me, hey, you listen. Paul saw the resurrected Jesus, and it changed everything. Some of you may have heard the name J. Warner Wallace. J. Warner Wallace, he's been around a little. Um, he is a forensics detective specializing in cold cases. Wallace, for many, many years, most of his lifetime kind of scoffed at Christianity. You know, as a forensics detective, he really thought that the resurrection was nonsense. And it got to a point in his life where it gnawed at him so badly that he was going to use his skills as a forensic detective to kind of put an end to all of this resurrection nonsense. He was going to look at all of the evidence, all of the, all of the testimonies, all the archaeological evidence, all the clues that we have now uh, in regards to the resurrection and he was going to try to disprove it all. So he spent a long period, a season of his life, trying to do that very thing. He was going to disprove Christianity because he thought that highly of himself and his skills. But after all of these months, all of these years of researching, looking at the evidence, he came to one big conclusion. That this resurrection of Jesus was absolutely real. And not only was it real... He knew that he needed Jesus Christ in his own life. Warner Wallace would, would later say, The resurrection is reasonable. The answers are available, and you don't have to turn off your brain to be a believer. Put all of this together, folks, and what we have here is the conclusion. The resurrection is a historical event that can be substantiated by credible sources and eyewitness accounts that can't be refuted. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, well, what in the world does that have to do with me? I mean, what's the big deal about that? Yes, they can now substantiate the resurrection. Without a doubt, the eyewitness testimonies, they can't be refuted. There's plenty of evidence that states in history that Jesus Christ was alive, he was killed, and then he resurrected. What does that have to do with me? The big deal is this. Because if Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God, and he was raised from the dead, then you can't really ignore what he said and did during his earthly ministry. You see, if Jesus Christ actually was the Son of God, and he was raised from the dead, then you have to pay attention to everything else he said in his ministry. You can't ignore what he says about God. You can't ignore what he says about life, about death, about sin, about judgment, about grace, about salvation you got to pay attention to those things now because he has demonstrated what I'm saying is true. And I am indeed the Son of God. Tim Keller puts it this way. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching. Everything hangs on whether or not he rose from the dead. Which really leads us to the second point, that revelation, that, that, the, the second revelation that we find here in, in Luke 24. The resurrection is the key to understanding all of Scripture and verifies everything Jesus taught about himself. You know, as we look at this account, and we look at the women at the tomb. We look at the men on the, the road to Emmaus. And we look at the disciples in the locker room. You will find something very, very interesting that ties them all together. And that is, in every instance, you find God reminding them 
what Jesus had said. For instance, when the angels are, are appearing before the women, and the women are lost, they're confused, they don't know what to make of the empty tomb, the angel says, he is not here, he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again? Then the women remembered his words. Now we find something very similar happen on the road to Emmaus when Jesus appears to the couple. They're distraught, they're confused, they don't, want, they don't know what to make of the cross and, and this rumor of the resurrection and all of this stuff. In, in verse 25, Jesus appears to them and this is what he says. How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and enter into glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explains to them what he said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He's reverting them back to the word of God. When he appears before the disciples, he does the same thing. This is what I told you while I was still with you, he says in verse 44. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened up their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Three separate instances where you find people lost and confused and bewildered. And three separate instances where God reminds them of his word. What is the message here? I think one of the messages is that how weak we become when we stray from God's word. You know, no one is looking for the resurrection because everyone has forgotten Jesus' teaching on the matter. I mean, what should have been a, a day of great anticipation, a great, a, day, a great day of joy as they're looking forward to the resurrection is nothing more than a day of gloom and dread and despair. Why? Because they had forgotten God's word on the matter. Friends, we do ourselves a terrible disservice when we neglect God's word. You know, in God's word, not only do we find God's plan for the world, we find God's plan for our own personal world. I mean, in God's, in God's word, we find words of wisdom, insight, direction. And, you know, we find ourselves very weak, confused, distraught when we neglect God's word. I mean, think about it. The people in the resurrection account, they were lost and confused. So what does God do? He directs them back to his word. Friends, there's a message there for all of us when you think about it. But take note where God directs these individuals, especially on the road to Emmaus and with the disciples. He directs them where? He directs them to the prophets, Moses, and the Psalms. What we would consider today the Old Testament. Why does he direct them there? He directs them there because it's in the Old Testament that we find the New Testament in the coming of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament prepares the way for the New you know, you're always going to find these people, I know you've heard some, and I know I've heard in my lifetime, people will say, even some Christians will say, you know, I don't really pay attention to the Old Testament. I'm a New Testament type of person. You know, you know the Old Testament, it was there for a certain time period and a certain group of people, so, so I, don't really apply, I don't really use the Old Testament. I'm a New Testament person. I've actually heard people say here recently, listen, I don't even need the Bible, I just need Jesus. Friends, what we need to understand is you can't separate it. The Old Testament prepares the way for the coming of Jesus in the New Testament. You can't separate God from his word. You know, we need the Old Testament because the Old Testament points the way to Jesus of the New Testament. The truth of the matter is this. Jesus knows that all scripture points to him, and this is why he directs his followers back to Moses, the prophets, and also the Psalms. I mean, look here in verse 44. This is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now pay close attention to what he just said there. He said everything must be fulfilled as it's predicted and prophesied about in what we would call the Old Testament. Everything must be fulfilled. I mean, that word must, that, that's the word that sticks with me. Everything must be fulfilled. 
Why? Why must everything, why must everything be fulfilled? Well, first reason, because God's good on his word. God keeps his promises. You know, sometimes we get in our mind that, that this plan of saving mankind happened just before Jesus came to the earth. Friends, that's not when God came up with the plan to save mankind. God knew that he was going to have to save mankind before he even created this world. Before, before, we, were, were, before we even came into this earth, he already knew that Jesus was coming. You see, he had to fulfill his word because if he didn't fulfill his word, he would be a liar. And that's something that God was not going to allow to happen. But there's another reason why he says everything must be fulfilled. Because without it, we're dead. We have no hope. He has to fulfill it because we need to be saved from our sins. You know, Romans 3.23 says it all. And there Paul says, for everyone is sin and fallen short of God's glorious standard. We've all sinned, Paul says. We've all done things to break the commandments and to break God's heart. That in itself is tragic, but yet the news gets a little worse. Because according to Romans 6.23, just three chapters over, Paul says this. He says, the wages of sin is death. In other words, there are consequences to the things that we've done against God. Now, we've talked about this before. If you're a regular attender here, we touch on this every once in a while. The wages of sin is death. What's a wage? A wage is your, your earnings. It's your paycheck. It's what you're owed. So when... When Paul says the wages of sin is death, what he's saying is because of all the things you've done against God, yeah, you got something coming to you. You've got a paycheck. You've earned something because of all of the sin in your life, and it's something called death. Death here does not refer to physical death. It refers to, to spiritual death. Spiritual death is to live all eternity without God in a place called hell. You know, we don't like to talk about hell a whole lot. I don't like to talk about hell, but at the same time, it's part of the Word of God. We have to discuss it, especially on Easter. But here's the good news. God knows that that's the consequences of sin, but at the same time, He doesn't want you to have to suffer those consequences. So He made a way for you to have your debt paid so that you can be forgiven and also have eternal life with Him. You see, sometimes we forget that there's a second part to Romans 6, 23, and it's this. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he took your sins, your past sins, your present sins, any sin that you will ever make in your lifetime, and he placed it on himself. So that when Jesus died on the cross, what he was doing was he was paying your penalty he took the bullet that was owed to you. He paid the price for your sin, and through his blood, your sins are atoned for. So when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what you're actually doing, folks, is you are receiving payment for, his, for, uh, for your sins. That's what it means to receive Jesus. I mean, not only are you welcomed into the family of God, not only are you forgiven of your sins and you have a new relationship with God, your sins are paid for. You now, you, you owe no more debt. For those that reject Jesus and say, you know, I don't believe in Jesus, I don't need Jesus, well, they still have a debt to pay. But it's here where a lot of people stumble because not only do they have a hard time believing that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, but the manner in which he pays for our sins, the cross? I mean, how offensive is that? I mean, the idea that, that God would lower himself to such a point that he would give his own son, I mean, that's despicable. That's one reason, by the way, that Muslims do not believe in the God of the Bible. They do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They do not believe that God would lower himself to such a point that he would allow his son to be sacrificed by sinners. But yet that's the truth. You know, a number of years ago, about five or six years ago, a Franciscan university in Steubenville, uh, Ohio, they were posting some online theology programs uh, that they were offering on Facebook. And as they were offering these programs and advertising what these programs entailed, they put a picture of Jesus on the cross in the background, 
and Facebook immediately shut them down. According to Facebook, that image was shocking, sensational, and excessively violent. Now, to Facebook's utter surprise, the Franciscan University actually agreed with them. You know, you're absolutely right. That image is shocking, sensational, excessively violent. They gave a rebuttal on a blog, and this is what the university said. Indeed, the crucifixion of Christ was all of those things. It was the most sensational action in history. Man executed his God. It was shocking, yes. God lowered himself to take on flesh and was obedient unto death, even death on a cross. It was certainly excessively violent. A man scourged to within an inch of his life, nailed to a cross, left to die. All the hate of all the sin in the world poured out its wrath upon his humanity. The university went on to explain that at any point, Jesus could have taken himself off the cross, but it was love that kept him on it. He says, no, it was love that kept him there. Love for you, love for me, that we might not eternally be condemned for our sins, but might have life eternal with him and his Father in heaven. Facebook later apologized and said, hey, I'm, we're sorry, we, we all make mistakes. Which, when you think about it, is the reason that Jesus Christ came to earth in the first place, because we all make mistakes. And we need our sins, our sins atoned for. Which really leads us to the last point before we close, folks. And the last point is simply this. The resurrection is the good news that Jesus wants his church to proclaim. Another thread that we find wound in Luke 24 is not only the message that he is risen, but also the mission that we, his church, need to proclaim it. You know, over again, we find that, you know, as, as, as these people discover that Jesus is indeed, he's alive, he is, he is risen from the grave, over and again, we find that their first instinct is to go and tell other people. You know, if you go back to verse 9, when the women came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. When the couple on the road to Emmaus discovered that they were in the midst of the risen Jesus, in verse 33, they got up, returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, saying, It's true, he is risen. And then, when Jesus appears to the disciples, what does Jesus say? You need to go out, and you need to tell other people about this. In verse 46, he told them, This is what's written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead, and on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. Big picture is simply this. When you know in your heart of hearts that Jesus Christ is alive, and he's alive in you, and Jesus Christ has transformed your life, and you've seen his miracles in your own life. And you know that he has the power to change, to heal, to transform, to resurrect. That's just that's not, not something that you keep to yourself. In fact, it's his charge to you to go out and tell other people. In the words of David Jeremiah, if we understand what lies ahead for those who don't know Christ, there will be a sense of urgency in our witness. You know, you may recall an incident that happened just last summer on the hit game show Jeopardy. I mean, this, it's, it's funny how certain stories just make the news and so, suddenly they go viral. This is one of them. Uh, on Jeopardy last, I think it was last June, there were three contestants. Uh, they had already answered all sorts of really hard, tough questions about a variety of academic subjects. I mean, these were very, very smart intellectual people. Well, near the end of the show, the hosts... She asks a spiritual question, and the spiritual question is this. You need to fill in the blank. Our Father, which art in heaven, blank be thy name. Not only did the contestants not know the answer, they didn't even attempt to try to answer it. They just kind of looked at each other kind of dumbfounded like it was, you know, some type of foreign language. that No one knew. The host actually had to tell them the answer to the question, and the show went on. The next day, social media was lit up with people that were just aggravated and angry that these smart people didn't know the answer. One person even wrote on a blog, 
The answer is hallowed, you bunch of heathens. It's hallowed be thy name. Another person said, how could these smart people get a simple question so wrong? How do you not know the Lord's Prayer? Over and again, people were were upset. They were angry that these, these intellectual types didn't know the Lord's Prayer. I mean, it just seemed so simple. But friends, that's the point. You see, to you and me, people that perhaps grew up in church, yeah, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Prayer, that's another sermon for another time. But the Lord's Prayer, it it is simple. We know it backwards and forwards. But if a person didn't grow up in church, if they they weren't raised in a Christian home, if they had no spiritual upbringing or teaching whatsoever, how do we expect them to know such things? You know, sometimes we in church, we've, we've grown so accustomed to church that at times we take it for granted, don't we? I mean, the things that seem so elementary to us, so simple to us, it's not so elementary to a lot of people. A vast majority of people in this world, they don't know about the resurrection. They don't know about Jesus, and they certainly don't know the Lord's Prayer. How will they ever know these things? Friends, that's where you and I come in. The same charge that was given to the disciples is the same charge given to us. I love Paul's words in Romans 10. These words are actually printed on our wall right behind the welcome desk. When you're leaving today, you'll see it in huge, huge big letters. It takes up an entire wall. Paul says in Romans 10, But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring the good news. You see, when you get right down to it, folks, our, believer, our, our job as believers is not to judge. It's simply to proclaim to proclaim that he is risen, to proclaim that hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. And this Jesus, he can heal, he can transform, he can raise, he can resurrect. In the words of Lee Strobel, Jesus did not come into this world to make bad people good. He came into this world to make dead people alive. Friends, as we close today, the question I have for you is, do you know Jesus as your Savior? You know, on Easter Sunday, people come to church for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes people come, most people come to, to legitimate worship the risen Christ. But sometimes you have people come out of tradition, out of habit. Sometimes, let's be honest, some people are kind of get their arm twisted. No, today you're going to church with me. It's Easter. But you know, Just because a person's in a church building doesn't mean that they've received Jesus as their Savior yet. So the question that I have for you today is, when you search your heart of hearts, has Jesus become Lord of your life? If not, hey, why not accept him today? I cannot think of a better day to receive Jesus than on Easter Sunday. Receive Jesus today and have Easter resonate in your heart and life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for giving us this day. Lord, today we have reason to celebrate. Lord, you are risen. You are alive and you are sitting on the right hand of God even as we speak. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming into our dark world. We thank you, Lord, for suffering the way that you suffered so that we could have eternal life. Lord, we don't even know how to begin to say thank you. But Lord, today we do come our hearts bowed before you, praising your name, worshiping you, and thanking you, Lord, for what you've done. Lord, our simple prayer, Lord, is that, Father, help today not to be the only day we recognize that. Help today not to be the only day that we worship you. But, Lord, help our lives to be a living sacrifice to you. Help our bodies to be a living temple to you so that each and every day through the way that we love, the way that we live, the way that we act, that we are offering you our worship through our very lives. Help what we discover here today to be a catalyst for what's going to follow in the coming weeks. And Lord, if there is someone here that does not know you as Savior, 
I pray that through your power, the moving of your Holy Spirit, that today you will open up their heart so that they may receive you, so that today they walk out of here a brand new person. Lord, thank you for this glorious time of worship. And Lord, as in the last few remaining minutes, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will move. In your name that we pray, amen. Well, good morning indeed. You know, what a, what a phenomenal message this morning on an amazing Sunday. As we transition into our time of giving his tithes and our offerings, I want to begin with this. As Pastor Tommy alluded, sometimes people come here for the first time. If you're a first-time visitor here, if this is not your church, we don't ask that you give anything other than your attention what was said and what was shared this morning as we pass the offering buckets in a few minutes this is our gift to you if this is your first Sunday at the same time if this is your first Sunday and you don't have a church home we hope you found one today we do today is a big deal today is a day that really divides history you know when you think about it if you're a sports fan you may have been watching March Madness, but those memories will fade. You, talk, you hear people talk about, well, they've got their 15 minutes of fame. You may talk about, well, this happened then or this happened at that time, but those memories fade. But today we come to worship a gentleman that divided history. You know, we think about, we, we, we date things. From B.C. and A.D., Jesus Christ divided history for us. And that is an amazingly big deal. So let's hear what Scripture has to say this morning. I'm Ephesians chapter 1. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. It says this, Follow God's example, therefore as dearly loved children, that's a charge to each and every one of us to follow him, not just on Easter Sunday, but the other 364 days of the year. It says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love as God loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That's a charge to us this morning. We have multiple ways to participate in giving back to him. I couldn't help but think as Pastor Tommy was speaking this morning about the last chapter in John, chapter 21, when Jesus reinstates Peter. He told Peter, go and feed my sheep. That's our charge to us, to feed his sheep day in and day out, not just on Easter Sunday, but the rest of the year. There's multiple ways to participate financially for this church, but it's not just for Point North. This is for his kingdom. You can go online, pointnorth.org, follow the prompts there. You can go to the Church Center app and follow the prompts there. If you're watching from home this morning, welcome. Mail will check in to 110 Bilo Drive. We're going to pass the buckets in just a moment. But it is time for us to go and worship the Christ that divided history. And it's time for us to go and feed his sheep. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you 
God, right now, we can't be humble enough. God, we can't be good enough. God, we can't be thankful enough on our own. But through your power and what you did 2,000 plus years ago on our behalf makes us those things. God, we've got to share that with each and every person we come in contact with to feed your sheep. And it's the name of your son, Jesus, the risen Christ. We ask these things. Amen. I know that today, Easter Sunday, is just a day of hope for us all, knowing what Jesus did for us, but we have to remember it was by his blood that he did it. This home belongs to the Lord. I'm not afraid to remind him. He has no claim in this war. I plead the blood. I plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood.
next week.